Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to read verses 6 through 11. Is that right? Yeah. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the word of faith and the sound doctrine which you have been following. But nothing, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourselves, yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only a little profit, is only of a little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance for it is for it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is our savior of all men especially the believers prescribe Please give me the ability to proclaim your word well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are this morning going to be looking at, um, in our, our survey of the letters of 1 Timothy and Titus. So for interest of time, we're going to jump straight in. We've been looking at this timeline that we have had up. So re- remember... Where we left Paul at the end of the book of Acts was in prison, and last week we talked about the prison epistles. These are letters that Paul is writing from prison, and in terms of the biblical evidence that we have that God has given us of what happens with the life of Paul, that's, that's where everything just ends. But from strong church, church tradition, as well as doing a little detective work through the reading of the letters that came later than the conclusion of the book of Acts, we're able to piece together that Paul, and this is according to the strongest church tradition and the best evidence, was released from prison. Remember, he had had years now of being held in Caesarea, traveling to Rome, and however long he was held in Rome before his trial, and all the evidence seems to say that he was released that the Roman authorities didn't want to hear this religious problem. He had committed no Roman crimes, so he was released to go about ministry sometime in the very early 60s. Now, if you look at different biblical scholars, some person may say he was released in 61. Someone may say, well, I think he was probably held until 63. And so we, we don't know because... We have textual evidence, not hard historical dating, but we understand that very early in the 60s that Paul was released and and appears to have continued in ministry. And we don't don't know exactly what it was that he did during this time, uh, but we have some pretty good speculation that he continued in travels. We know his heart's desire was to go all the way to Spain. And according to some of the church fathers, it is possible that he did indeed go to Spain. Uh, we, as we read that it said he went to the extreme west. Well, there's not much further west than Spain in continental Europe. And so people imagine and guess where could Paul have gone? Where we do know that he went were some different places uh, around the Aegean Sea. Because as we get to some of the letters that he writes, particularly 2 Timothy, and he says places that he has been, and even in 1 Timothy and in Titus, talking to his, these young pastors that he was mentoring, the places we know that he went to were um, Nicopolis, which is up there in Greece, that's in the yellow. Um, we know he went to Crete and to Miletus and Troas. Uh, It's possible he went to Colossae, because remember the book of Philemon, he said, I hope to come see you in Colossae, to deal with both some heresy that was arising there, but also to see his friend Onesimus, as well as Philemon. 
And it, it is possible that he could have stopped in Ephesus, although there's no record of that. It is in the general area. So we don't, we don't know all of his activities because it's not recorded for us, but we see that he is free to be doing ministry for a short time. In, in, a, way, in a way, we kind of could view that as an Indian summer. You know, when winter starts and you think winter's there and then all of a sudden it gets really nice for a couple weeks. And then, then the real winter comes. And really in Paul's ministry, this seems to be his, his last big missions push before he'll be arrested again. And this time, it'll end in the loss of his life. But he does a couple other things, and our, and our best evidence are that he wrote uh, the pastoral epistles of 1 Timothy and Titus during this time, during his travels. Uh, whether Paul had any premonition from the Holy Spirit or not that he could be arrested again, it's, it's evident from the strong impression and leading of the Holy Spirit in his life that he always lives under the understanding that this could come to a quick conclusion. Remember when he first went to Jerusalem, he told the fellow believers he did not know if that would end in his death. So in a sense, you can understand that Paul probably thinks he's living on borrowed time. And part of the, what we're going to see in this study this morning, even as we go very quickly, is that we are to be called to be faithful in the opportunities that God has given each and every one of us. But part of what we are to be doing with those opportunities is always to be preparing people to continue in ministry. It, it, it's, it's like running a relay. Some of you remember that if in track. Some of you ran track. Um, some of you have watched track, at least the Olympics. And how they have this baton, and someone starts the race with the baton, and they run the first leg of the relay. And as they get to a certain um, preordained spot on the track, they have to pass the baton to the next runner who will take and run. Now in ministry, it's a little bit different because it's not quite such hard lines where one person takes the baton and the other person runs, but there can be overlap in ministry. And what Paul is trying to do right here is he's preparing these young men to carry the torch after he is gone. And, and that is something that each of us is called to do. And so we see these letters here to Timothy and Titus, respectively. And while we may say that the theme is church order, because they are young pastors, and he's telling them, this is how you go about pastoring, you might also say it's instructions for young pastors in difficult times, because that's what's going on with them. They're in churches, and the church would be great, except for one small problem. It's full of people. And it's called to minister to people. And whenever you put people in a situation, we just have a tendency to mess things up. And we really need to be fully relying on God's work. And Paul is giving them instruction about how they can continue in the ministry. We, we, we see that this is a really important concept. The idea of mentorship, discipleship, of training of receiving instruction so that we too will be able to carry on in ministry. It's a, it's a really interesting thing when you're being entrusted to a ministry. Uh, I, most, most people I've talked to and most of the people I trust say, oh, there's no possible way I can do this. The, the job is too big. I can't ever possibly fill the shoes of, of the great men and women of God who have gone before. And hopefully that's an attitude that all of us have. Because each and every one of us need to be fully dependent on God and his working. Because it is not by human effort that his purposes are accomplished. But what we will read here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and in this first part, this is what I'm hoping you can continues to go through your mind. I know we're not on 2 Timothy today, but this verse, even though it's in the next letter to Timothy, I think encapsulates the reasoning for these letters. He says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
See, when, in, in ministry, we're not called to a position that we keep as our own, but rather we're called to a mission that we're to be in continual partnership with, being trained by and training someone else. I was told a long time ago that in your life, you should always have somebody that you are pouring into and somebody that is pouring into your own life. It's, it's, it's like a river, not a pond. It's not, or it's not a cul-de-sac, right? Somebody is pouring into your life spiritually, but in turn, you should be pouring into somebody else's life spiritually. And there are different phases of life and different ways that it can be. Sometimes it's your children, Sometimes it's a coworker. Sometimes it's an unbeliever that you're spending the, the bulk of your time ministering to. But all of us should both have input and output spiritually. And, and as we think about this too, one other thing I want, I want to encourage all of you, wherever you are spiritually, is that it takes time to be developed for ministry. This is not just something you wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a pastor, where is a church? Right? Or I'm going to wake up one day and say, I have arrived. But even, we, we oftentimes when we read the Bible, we see these great men and women of the faith and we have this perception that they came to Christ and they were immediately useful for service to the fullest extent which we see in Scripture. We forget that what is recorded are kind of the high points or notable episodes from their life that the Holy Spirit has preserved. And we think of men like the Apostle Paul, and our natural understanding would be, who could replace such a man? As if he was someone, and he was, powerfully used by God, and prepared by God for a specific work, commissioned as an apostle, but we think that's who he always was. But, but even... The Apostle Paul, when he came to faith, a man who from childhood had been educated in the Old Covenant, who was zealous for the Lord, misguided, but zealous, what happened after his conversion in Damascus? By the passing of years. After his conversion, he spent time in Arabia, being taught of the faith by Christ. And learning, going back, you can imagine his consternation, you can imagine his confusion, as well as the joy of looking back at the Old Testament and saying, I've been looking at it from the wrong angle. I need to reread everything. And then even after his time in Arabia, sharing Christ as he was with whoever would listen, he went back to his hometown of Tarsus and spent considerable time there. And Scripture is silent on what he did during those years. But we know he was growing. And then when he went to Antioch, he became a teacher. He wasn't yet the missionary, the apostle Paul that we know from reading the rest of Acts, but it says he was a teacher in partnership with other teachers. And then the Holy Spirit set him aside for a work specifically designed by God for Paul. But when he began, began this work, he started off as an assistant to Barnabas. We know that because of the way that the names are listed in Acts. It starts off Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul. And then at some point it shifts to go Paul and Barnabas. But first he was the assistant before he became a full partner, before he became pretty much the lead of the mission with Barnabas and then became the lead of his own missionary endeavors. It's there's a lot of time. There's a lot of development. There's years of growth and training. And we, we, need, we need to be aware of this. And we need to be intentional. We need to be prepared for service. And we need to be preparing others for service. I've, I've joked many times. I always call it the bus quotient. So what happens if I get hit by a bus? Right? I don't know why I chose a bus. I'd personally rather get hit by a meteor <laughs> because that would make, that'd be like, that'd be a really big story, right? I get hit by a bus, it's probably my fault. I get hit by a meteor, you just got to say that is flat the will of God. It was his time to go. Although, although the older I get, I start thinking, knowing people, someone will be like, I, I, I knew God was mad at him. <laughs> you know? 
If I, if, I, if I get hit by a meteor, you just need to know it's an answer to my prayer, the way I want to go. If it's not trumpet call, it's a pretty good way to go. I digress. Um, but, but what I'm thinking is, at, at any time, I know that my ministry could be cut short. Absolutely, it could end. And part of my job as your pastor... But part of all of our job and whichever mission we are called to, whether that's family or neighborhood or workplace or school, we need to make certain that we are involving other people in this ministry. It's the Lord's ministry. It's not ours. That we all get to be fellow laborers in. And I always have to be cognizant. If something goes wrong in my life, there needs to be somebody who can be there for the flock. Because it's not Troy's church. It's, no one, it's, it's Christ's church. And, and we, we should have that same care for the flock that are taken care of. I, I think in my own home, my own, my own upbringing, it took a long time to get here to be your senior pastor. But I, but I needed every single step of the way. And I remember times being frustrated saying, this is taking way too long. I, I, I have a passion to do something, and I feel like I'm in a secondary position. And just being content with what God was working in my own life, and to prepare in, in case the opportunity came for God to give me. So we need to, we need to be passing on what we have learned to faithful men and women who will learn to teach others also. And if you're, if you're being taught, we also need to have a teachable spirit. I know this is kind of a long introduction to a summary of these letters, but we need to have a teachable spirit. When, when you realize and are able to come to grips in your own pride and say that God doesn't need you. God doesn't need me. But God, in his love and his mercy, chooses to use us. That's so much more freeing to say, I can be faithful. I, I, I don't need to clamor for a position. I don't need to clamor for a claim. But rather to say, God, if you would choose to use me, I will be prepared and I will be ready just in case it's my time to speak to a friend, to a family member, maybe to enter in a formal role of ministry. And so... Titus and Timothy, they're being prepared for ministry. They've been being prepared. They've been co-laborers, travelers with Paul. But now they're out on their own. They've been thrown out of the nest. So Timothy has followed Paul wherever he has gone. And now he says, guess what? He's probably been on his own a little while, while Paul was locked up. You get to minister in Ephesus. And Titus, remember we just did this mission on Crete? You get to minister in Crete. And you need to prepare other men in those churches to become the pastors because your stay there will probably be short because you're going to have to take on the mantle that I've been carrying to minister and develop new bishops and overseers and deacons in various, various places. Uh, one of the first things that we see in both of these books here is a common theme that they have to deal with false teachers. If you look at the chapter one of the epistle of Timothy, at the very beginning, what we see there is that, that there is a fight. That there is, are two people specifically in this church who are causing dissension, who are teaching things which are not accurate about who Jesus Christ is. Paul goes at some length saying, this is, this is how the law is useful. Apparently these two men, if we go down to verse um, Verse 20, Hymenaeus and Alexander have been teaching things that should not have been taught, have been causing disruptions within the church. And Timothy specifically is called to speak against the error that is permeating the church in Ephesus. Um, there, there's a, a common theme throughout all the letters we're going to look at now, we mentioned this last week, that there are, there are falsehoods, there are heresies, there are wrong ideas that are beginning to creep into the church. There's a leadership vacuum. And sometimes into that leadership vacuum, people want to fill it 
to puff up their own ego, to put out their own thoughts instead of be relying on the word of God. Uh, Gordon Fee writes, the purpose of 1 Timothy arises out of these complexities. The letter betrays evidences everywhere that it was intended for the church itself. I want you to catch this. This is really interesting. And not just for Timothy. Because of defections in the leadership, Paul does not, as before, write directly to the church, but to encourage the church through Timothy. The reason this would have been for this would have been twofold. One, to encourage Timothy himself to carry out this most difficult task of stopping the erring elders who had become thoroughly dis disputatious and to authorize Timothy before the church to carry out his task. At the same time, of course, the church would have, be having the false teachers exposed before them, plus Paul's instruction about what he was to do. So, Think about what Paul is doing. He's writing a letter to Timothy to be read in the church, and on one, that's going to put a seal of approval saying, whatever Timothy says, I have full confidence in him. What he speaks is orthodox. It is in line with the teaching that, that has been given. But as the church hears this, it's not like, oh, well, Timothy is saying this, but Hymenaeus and Alexander are saying another thing. What should we listen to? See, it has that validation on the message, on the true gospel, as it's being proclaimed by Timothy. On the same time, to the church, even though it is to Timothy, it, it's to the church. And so they have Paul's word to them on proper order in the church. He, he tells him um, in chapter 1 to Timothy, This charge I commit you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, of, of which some have rejected concerning the faith and suffered shipwreck. What, what a horrible thing to think about. I don't know if things like that terrify you. They kind of terrify me. You see so many people in the Bible, so many people that you may know in your own personal life, that they start well. And they end so poorly. And every, every step of the journey has to be completely by God's grace. And if we get to a point of our Christian walk where we think we no longer need the Holy Spirit, we're in danger. If we get to the point of our, our Christian experience where we think, I've arrived and I can do this on my own and I am puffed up to interject my own wisdom as if it's on par with the writings of scripture, we are not only in error, but we're in danger. And we need to contend for the faith, and we see men who have suffered shipwreck. Let's not be those people, but let's be firmly committed and clinging to God's word and invested in his ministry and fully relying on the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. He says similar words to Titus. I know we're doing these at the same time. Warning of those who are in the church that need correction. In chapter 1, verse 10, it says that there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. That's saying those who want to return to the Old Covenant. Old Testament Judaism, wanting to return to the formal rules and regulations which had been completed in Christ. In verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving, giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Do you, do you understand that we're in a battle? 
that we are still in a battle, that we still must contend for the faith. This was not a first century problem. And there are men and women that, that we love, that we have partnered with, but at times will say something that is not accurately representing what Scripture says. And in our society, in our Western society, and I've said before, which is very polite, we, we still need to be able to say, that's not true. There are some things which are opinions, and, and we know that. And there are th some things which are legitimately disputable. But there are issues for which we cannot bend, and we cannot retreat, and we must not stay silent. And he's telling Timothy, who appears a lot more timid than Paul in comparison, he says, contend for the faith. Cling, hold fast to the faith. Instruct others in the faith. Like I said, we have to go quickly on these things. He also gives them order in the church, gives them roles. And we could talk about any one of these things a lot longer. But he says, appoint overseers in each and every church. And in 1 Timothy, this is in chapter 3. In Titus, it's in chapter 1. There are very much parallel passages to each other, telling each of them that you must appoint men over the churches who have the character in order to lead those churches. And, and, and we read these character qualities. And I want to read these here just from Timothy. We'll read them in chapter 3. And we'll just read verses 1 through 7. It says, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, some of your versions will say overseer and some will say elder. Those terms are all used interchangeably. They're translational choices. Then he desires a good work. A bishop must then be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. Not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and into the snare of the devil. We could talk about each and every one of those those character qualities. I remember as a young man, my, my youth pastor had a weekly discipleship group and we went through an old book. It was by Gene Getz. It was a measure of a man. And each chapter was on one of those qualities and saying, these are the character qualities that we as believers should be developing in our lives. And it, it, was, it was very valuable to begin to think of things which were not the way you were naturally wired. See, because when we start out, none of us have all these qualities. But, the, but they're developed by the Holy Spirit in our life along with the fruit of the Spirit, as, as we mature and as we grow and as we come into conformity with, what God is, with God's own character and what he's doing in our lives. But what I really want us to see is that look at this list of people who should be in charge of the ministry. They are character qualities, not proficiencies. If you have to choose between proficiency and character, choose character. Because... All of our successes, at least the lasting successes, are dependent on God. And the people that God would choose to serve are people who have a heart that follow after him. Sometimes we, we emphasize gifting over character. We see a lot of churches, you've seen a lot of mistakes throughout the years. They say this person was really successful in business outside the church. They have leadership skills. We should put them in a position of leadership within the church. And it's probably true they have very excellent leadership skills. But we're dealing with a different animal because we're talking about what God wants to do in the hearts of people. And our product is people. And we, we need to make certain, and, and Paul emphasizes in both these letters, character, maturity matters. And now, by the way, this does not mean that everyone who is that only the people 
whether they're elders or pastors, are the ones who have spiritual maturity. Not everyone is called to that role of being an overseer. But every, each and every one of you, whether you would ever be in a position of the overseer or elder, should aspire to have that same character qualities. Those, while they are necessary for church leadership, they should be aspirational for each and every one of us to reflect the heart of God and his holy character in everything that we do. Not everyone should aspire to be an elder or a teacher, but no one should be put on the sideline or disqualified because the character was not important for them to develop in yielding themselves to the Holy Spirit and the work that he would do. Along with this, he says, do not, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. In chapter 5, he says a, a, a leader in a church shouldn't be a novice, shouldn't be new. Church has done this wrong lots of times. We've seen this, right? A celebrity comes to faith and we want to make him God's spokesperson. They haven't even read the whole Bible yet. And like, but you're so talented and people love you. Can you be God's spokesperson? And you hear a lot of Christian celebrities, I mean, celebrities before they were Christians, who come to faith and say, that was a really hard role and it was unfair. And, and I, we made a lot of mistakes along the way. You have people who weather that storm but we need to give people the chance to grow so that, they, so that they can thrive and be nurtured before they're thrown into the deep end. I want to read this quote here, and then we'll move on from this because we've got, we got to move quickly. It's by Chuck Swindoll um, from his book, Rise and Shine. He says, Ministry is a character profession. To put it bluntly, you can sleep around and still be a brain, good brain surgeon. You can cheat on your mate and have little trouble continuing to practice law. Apparently, it's no problem to stay in politics and plagiarize. You can be a successful salesperson and cheat on your income tax. But you cannot do these things as a Christian or as a minister and continue to enjoy the Lord's blessing. You must do right in order to have true integrity. If you can't come to terms with evil or break habits or continue or break habits that continue to bring reproach on the name of Christ, please do the Lord and us a ministry a favor and resign. So we need, we need to make certain that we are people who, who still value holiness. None of us are perfect, and we don't want to be the type of people who are legalistic and harsh. We want to be people of grace and love, but we also need to know where we're headed together. And God loved us enough to save us where we were at, but he's loved us enough not to leave us there. And we cannot settle for the lies and the debaucheries and abuses and everything that goes on in this world, but we need to follow Jesus Christ. And to that, Paul says, you need to have God, godliness in doctrine and in deed. And that doesn't matter whether you're a young pastor or an old saint or a new believer. This is what we all need. I'll just read a couple more passages and then we'll wrap this up. In 1 Timothy 6, Paul writes to Timothy, if anyone teaches otherwise counter to sound doctrine and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with the disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such men, withdraw yourselves. Or then in Titus, in chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says similar things. He says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us the denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, 
looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Yeah, the, the churches in Crete and the church in Ephesus were in need of some redirection. And, and such is the case whenever, whenever we take our, our eyes off of Jesus Christ and put it on someone else. Could be ourselves. Could be looking in the mirror. Could be somebody else that you idolize or hold in higher esteem. It could be many voices from the culture around. But when we look someplace other than our Lord and Savior, that we, that we will veer off course. And really, these letters are a call to focus your eyes back on Jesus, who gives in good instruction and advice and counsel for how we should go about his business. Um, in, we need to go about training our replacements and being the people that God would use. Many, many people in the Bible re were rejected because of, because of their character. One of the most notable people in the Bible that was rejected, of course, was King Saul, who looked the part. He was tall. He was handsome. He began his reign with a military victory. He was the king the people wanted. But he was also a coward who cared more about what people thought than what God was concerned about. And so God chose for himself a shepherd because he said, this is a man after my heart. God, God doesn't need the externals. God doesn't need us. This verse uh, that I wanted to close with on your screen are the words of Jesus at that great confession where he says, I will build my church. And that should be reassuring too. Praise the Lord that he doesn't need us, that his church will continue and endure with or without our participation in the Lord's work. But praise the Lord that he invites us into it and that he is changing lives and giving us opportunities to be about his business. So let's be the people that God is pleased to use to be about his glory, to be about his purposes. And as a church just committed that we would be the church that he has called us to be.